Hello and welcome to the WOW Podcast, episode 15, where we are connecting and empowering women through sport. I'm Jude Kenny, and as always, joining me virtually this time is our lovely co-host, Janine Samuels and Stephanie DeJokian. Hello, ladies. Hey there. <laughs> Hello. Today, we are joined in segment two by a special guest, the sustainability manager for our partner, RTS, Hannah Moskowitz. Hannah was the voice behind the virtual learning activities for Earth Day on RTS's website. We are looking forward to learning more about who Hannah is and her accomplishments next, but first, let's jump into some Redskin news and league updates. Uh, training camp is going to look a little different this year. We will not be heading to Richmond due to league restrictions on the use of other facilities for training camp. Two key factors in mind for this and why the decision was made, the obvious need for travel and limiting the risks associated with that travel and the risk of maintaining two different facilities as opposed to one during COVID. Redskins will be staying in Ashburn at Redskins Park, which in my opinion for Redskins head coach Ron Rivera's first training camp with the Washington Redskins, it may end up being more convenient for him to hold all operations at home, home base, as opposed to moving around between Ashburn and Richmond. Camp is supposed to start on July 28th. There has been no formal announcement. Obviously, we will keep you up to date once we know. If it gets moved back, what do you think will happen? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a great question because no one knows, right? There's so much speculation out there right now because no formal announcements have been made. Um, there was a recommendation from the Joint Committee on Health and Safety, and they basically recommended an acclimation period before camp of anywhere from one week to up to three weeks. And that's basically to give players a better chance to just get their feet up under them and just practice and just get back on the field and play. Um, now this would have players reporting even earlier in July or another option that has been floating around out there is just having a two game preseason instead of a four game preseason. Yeah. Uh, that's right. It was reported by the NFL Network um, that the NFL and NFL Players Association were discussing the possibility of shortening the 2020 preseason. So cutting the preseason in half would, as you mentioned, Janine, allow for a longer ramp up period, giving players time to prepare physically to participate in training camp if we have it and games coming off an unusual off season that was restricted by COVID-19 pandemic. Actually, ESPN just reported uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. He said that football needs to emulate the plans of the NBA and the MLS for a bubble format. Um, you know, and that means that they need to be isolated from others and tested every day. So there's a lot of just a lot of information coming in and it's, it's all new to us. So we're learning as we go and, and that's mm -hmm. the latest we're hearing. Yeah. And it'll be interesting yeah. to see how, um, the NBA playoffs, uh, happen. You know, I think a lot, like, as you mentioned, the NFL is going to learn from what other leagues and other teams are doing. Yeah, I mean, and to case in point, Jade, you know, with the Canadian Football League, you know, they have played a two game preseason for years. So if the NFL does decide to go that route, at least there is a model out there. And then like you mentioned with the NBA and I'm kind of being quarantined and having, you know, elevated safety precautions to make sure that the players, officials, coaches and all of them, you know, are safe during um, play. Uh, that could be, again, something that the NFL takes on. So, you know, bottom line, we all want we all want football, right? Like that is, mm -hmm. I know the highlight of my year when football season comes, you know, definitely going to miss being in Richmond for training camp. Absolutely amazing experience last year, especially for me as the end game host and just being in that environment around all the fans. But what's most important is that we are safe and that we stay healthy. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I could not have said that better. We all want it back, but safety is the top priority. Um, I, before we close segment one, segment one, we've got to highlight this incredible story on Redskins legend, Doug Williams. If you have not watched it yet, please check it out. Uh, NFL Films documentary, it is called Through Adversity. I watched it last night and I watched a couple, and then I got so into it that I was just Googling all the films um, and different videos on the internet about Doug Williams because I was uh, very young <laughs> during the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> and I just unfortunately was not educated well on this, um, on just how big of a legend he is. What did you guys think? Um, well, first of all, you know, just that documentary in and of itself was in its, it was short, but, you know, impactful. And then just the fact that there's going to be a movie made um, about his life. 
and there really just seems like there's so much content for a movie. Um, Doug Williams was actually on the Dan Patrick show just a couple of days ago, and he mentioned the fact that, you know, he was raised in South Louisiana, so he grew up very familiar with what racism was, and they talked about it a lot in his family, and he carried that throughout his career in college and obviously into the NFL, and he told a lot of different stories about how fans treated him when he was at Tampa Bay at first and how everyone referenced him as a black quarterback, black quarterback. And I think even one uh, reporter asked him, you know, how long have you been a black quarterback? You know what I mean? So he just had to deal with so much. Um, but he accomplished so much at the same time. And so I am very excited about not just the documentary, but also about this movie, and super curious too to find out who is going to play the Doug Williams. <laughs> like, who's going to be that character? <laughs> Those are big shoes to fill. Yeah. Yes. I mean, my thoughts obviously, every time I talk with Doug or hear him speak at different events for the team or, or watch documentaries, I learn a little more about his journey as a player and his inner strength. Um, he truly is kind-hearted, and it shows in all he does, how he takes the time to talk with my sons when we go to Richmond for training camp or we're at the park. Um, his, any fans, I mean, anyone. And it's unfair that his journey had to be so different from that of a white quarterback, and thus why we must continue to fight that fight that Black Lives Matter. And I think I'm going to follow up and, and look more into his autobiography called uh, Quarter Black, Shattering the NFL Myth. So I'll let you guys know what I think about that after reading. Yeah, it. yeah, please do. And, and one thing that um, I found and, and took away uh, while researching Doug Williams and his incredible uh, story this morning, he uh, mentioned that when he received fan mail or mail, if it didn't have a return address, he threw it away. And I loved that. Uh, especially in um, a, a world of social media where you deal with trolls and just sometimes hurtful comments and, and mean-spirited people. I love that he basically was saying, you know, if it wasn't serving me a positive message, if you didn't have the courage uh, to put your name and your address on something that you were going to say to him, he didn't take it seriously. And I think that is a uh, huge lesson to take away. Do not let those things affect you um, by people that are being cowards. And so I loved that. And I am even more of a fan of him now. Um, before we wrap up, I'm just going to plug, uh, if you have not had a chance to listen to episode seven of the wow, we had an incredible interview with the superwoman herself, the wife of Doug Williams, Rhonda Williams here. And she was giving, um, a little bit more behind the scenes of what it is like to be the partner to him, but also just, um, great advice for women. So definitely check that out. Next up, we talk to our special guest this week, Sarah Moskowitz. That's next. Staying up to minute with all Redskin news this off season. Download the official Washington Redskins mobile app. Geographic and device restrictions apply. Data charges may also apply. Did you know that your Washington Redskins are sponsored by Coke Industries? That's K-O-C-H Coke. Their 76,000 U.S. employees make a lot of things that make game day better. Greener turf, they make that. Stronger paper products for tailgating? Yep, they make that. Oh, and electronic components and TVs and smart devices so you can watch a Redskins victory anywhere? Yeah, Coke makes that too. See all they make for on and off the field at kochmakesthat.com. You're ready to drive again. Enjoy the open road with confidence and powerful performance of a new Honda. From stylish turbocharged sedans like the Accord and Civic to rugged all-wheel drive SUVs like the CRV, HRV, Pilot, and Passport. With safety features like Honda Sensing, including a collision mitigation braking system, adaptive cruise control, Honda Lane Watch, and more. Get a great deal on your favorite Honda. Contact your local Honda dealer for more information or visit WashingtonAreaHondaDealers.com. Hello and welcome back to the Wild Podcast, where we are empowering and connecting women through sports. As I mentioned today, we have a very, very special guest to celebrate 50 years of Earth Day. RTS Hannah Moskowitz developed a free online learning curriculum for ages 5 to 12. Hannah, we would like to get to know a little bit about you before we get into the wonderful accomplishments that you have done. How did you get interested in sustainability and what was your path into this career look like? Yeah, uh, so growing up, I always knew that I wanted to be in the environmental field and study environmental studies, uh, but I didn't exactly know what. Uh, sustainability wasn't really on my radar and it wasn't really popular yet. Uh, 
so until I was in college and I got my first internship in a sustainability office, I hadn't really heard of it. Uh, and from there, I just knew I loved it and I knew I wanted to be in the field and I wanted to help people, you know, reduce their impact on the environment. Perfect. And so if you could just, it, I guess this is a, a part A and a part B, but if you could, for people that don't really understand what sustainability is as it relates to it being a profession, if you could speak a little bit to that, like in layman's terms, and then talk a little bit about how, um, you know, your mission and your company and what you all are doing in light of COVID-19. Sure. Yeah. So sustainability in general, um, can have a lot of different definitions, but here we're talking about environmental sustainability. So that can be reducing water, reducing waste, energy, things like that. Um, and specifically focusing on buildings. So how buildings can you know, run as efficiently as possible, reduce their waste. So here at RTS, uh, we focus specifically on waste and we help our clients reduce you know, their amount of trash that they produce, um, increase their diversion rates, try to recycle as much as possible, donate materials that they're not using anymore. So kind of things like that, we're kind of a one-stop shop. So we pick up trash, you know, and we, we have to take care of that, but we also have a sustainability team uh, where we help make everything more sustainable. Um, and then for COVID-19, uh, during the pandemic, you know, our waste haulers are really important. We still need to pick up trash, right? Um, but we wanna make sure it's as safe as possible. So most of our staff are working from home, kind of the back end people. And then our front end staff, uh, we provided them with PPE, uh, masks, gloves, uh, you know, if they're sick, don't come to work, things like that, and just making sure that everybody feels as safe as possible. Well, we appreciate all the work that uh, your employees and RTS is doing in a time like this. I want to know what type of job opportunities are there for women in the waste management field, and why aren't there more women going in this direction? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so there are a lot of women in the sustainability field in general, but there's definitely a gap within waste management and waste companies. Uh, before I came to RTS, actually, I was really interested in being in the waste industry. So I applied for jobs at different waste haulers, uh, and it was really surprising to see the different stereotypes. Uh, <laughs> during an interview, actually, I was asked if I'd even be okay with touching trash because I didn't come in work boots and I didn't look like somebody who wanted to get dirty. So, you know, that was really surprising, especially now, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the issue is that most traditional waste companies just aren't thinking about sustainability. You know, they're focusing on picking up trash and recycling, uh, but they're not looking at the more holistic approach like RTS is. You know, how can we do better with waste? But we are seeing more of this. Uh, the waste industry is making significant strides, but I'm so thankful to have found the opportunity with RTS where women and diversity in general are seen as valuable and important. Yeah, and I mean, to that point, I mean, you know, waste management doesn't sound like a sexy, fun, you know, industry in and of itself. But when you really understand the impacts that it can have on the environment, especially when you're talking about, um, you know, waste management in a very sustainable way, and then also recycling, it really does have a huge impact. And so when you take it from the commercial standpoint and bring it home to like the individual and the residential standpoint, can you just talk a little bit about how important it is just for like to recycle, for example, like I would go to my mom's house and they don't have the recycling bins. So I would literally take bags of recycle from her house, bring it all the way here to Prince George's County to recycle it. And literally they thought I was cuckoo, but why is it important? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it is so important. So, you know, if you don't separate your trash, all of these materials that could have been used, you know, think of food waste. If you don't separate your food waste and have compost, that's just gonna sit in a landfill for years. Instead, if you compost it, it can be changed into a useful product. That's the same as a plastic bottle. You know, we wanna reduce our use, but if you can't, you recycle it. And then that can be maybe made into a bench or something. Instead of sitting in a landfill, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So it's all about reuse and reducing, you know, the amount of new materials that we need. If we recycle, we don't have to use as many new materials. We've touched on this a lot, uh, obviously during the quarantine, a couple of weeks for the podcast, but families and companies are getting really innovative with activities to keep, um, you know, kids and families busy together. Let's talk about, uh, what you have done. What motivated you to create this online learning curriculum for kids and how did you do it? Yeah, so 
it basically, so it started that we had a ton of different Earth Day events planned. You know, it's the 50th anniversary. We're all so excited to support our clients and celebrate. And of course the pandemic hit and everything was canceled. You know, so we're sitting here thinking about how we can celebrate the 50th anniversary and channel this excitement into something that was gonna be useful for our community and our partners. So we saw this stat going out that 40% of residential waste um, had increased during the pandemic. And we know the fact that 75% of all waste could be recycled and repurposed. So we thought that a lesson plan would be a great way to educate families while everyone's working from home um, about how they can sort waste and kind of do it together correctly and in a fun way. Um, so we, we already have the channel on our RTS website. We already have blog posts about recycling and sustainability. Um, but because of the unique situation where everyone is stuck at home together, we thought that a lesson plan for kids would be a really great, great way to support our teachers and our parents and celebrate Earth Day together, um, and it would be helpful. And thankfully, you know, we have so many great partnerships like the Redskins where we were able to share this material out to their foundation and spread the word, word within the community, which was really great. It's so cool. And like, obviously, you don't have to have kids to participate in this, right? So you can still <laughs> yeah, have smart exactly. in, in these, yeah, in these smart practices. So talk a little bit about what a lesson plan would look like. So what are some of the steps for just our listeners so that maybe they can get started on this today? Yeah, so um, we started with, you know, a webinar, technically a webinar, but you know, it's just like a little video. Um, I believe it's about eight minutes long that kind of taught the kids or whoever wants to watch it. Um, about Earth Day in general, and then how to sort your waste and why it's important, which I think is really important because, you know, people know how to sort it, but the why behind it gets people excited and they understand it. Um, and then we had a couple activities that we could do. There was a crossword and kind of fun things and ex an extension activity where you could actually um, use like a celery or romaine lettuce to grow your own again. So we're using your food scraps. Uh, we had a little quiz on there. And there's also a recycling um, expert certificate that you can download uh, and put your name there and get really excited and take a picture, which was honestly the best part because we received so many photos of kids with their Earth Day expert certificate. And that was so fun to see. I was just about to ask that. What, what's the feedback, been back, the feedback been like from these activities? I mean, based on that, I'm sure it's really exciting to see that, especially with social media, just people getting really involved in this. Yeah, the feedback was great. I think we had around 10,000 visits um, and we were able to actually modify it to use it for different partners in Washington. And again, just the photos, you know, on social media to the email and everything of these kids. They're just so fun to see. Yeah, I mean, and it's taking a topic that, like, like I said earlier, isn't like glamorous and sexy but really bringing it home and making it practical for kids. And um, mm -hmm. to your point, really understanding the why behind what they're doing. Because for the longest time with this big recycle, recycle, and I know at work we'd have the bins where everyone knew that you needed to put your recyclable in there, but it wasn't always as clear as to why. And you know, you know what the true reason is, and how it there's so there's it's such a huge impact down the road, not just for your company, but in your community, but worldwide as well. So when you kind of think about sustainability and waste management and recycling and all of that, what do you hope to see in the future for the waste management industry and just how it can help to protect our environment? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I already see an incredible demand from the public who's starting to pay attention on their impact on the environment. You know, we have the plastic straw, for example. We all knew they weren't great for the environment, but until the public collectively spoke out, nothing was changed. Um, and now it's rare to see a plastic straw, right? Um, so I think that there will be increased realizations uh, that the individual has so much power to change the government and companies. Um, and I think we see it in all industries already that the public is starting to speak up as a whole. You know, they're talking to their representatives. They're boycotting companies that don't stand for equal rights. And I hope to see this continuing on in the environmental movement as well. Yeah, wonderful. That is wonderful. Well, Hannah, unfortunately, our time has come to an end. It has been a pleasure getting to meet you and learn more about RTS. I know they are a valuable 
partner of the Redskins and we appreciate all the work that you are doing. Uh, just want to give a quick mention to follow RTS on social. They're at, uh, at RTS Green. Next up, Janine, Stephanie, and I talk about some very special men in our life and who have inspired us. Whether from the sidelines or in the classroom, whether your chalkboard is for X's and O's or vocab words, whether you're a pro football coach or Mrs. Johnson at George Mason High School, the Washington Redskins believe in the power of great teachers. That's why we're partnering with youth entrepreneurs to bring Washington, D.C. teachers the resources they deserve. In response to the corona coronavirus pandemic, youth entrepreneurs have launched Teach Everywhere, a place for teachers to call home while adjusting to teaching at home. The resource contains distant learning activities, resources and tools, and a series of webinars from expert educators. Visit teacheverywhere.org to learn more. 75 tons of game day trash and recyclables need to find a home. So when the final whistle blows, our team hits the field. As an official partner of the Washington Redskins, RTS is connecting FedEx Field with smarter way solutions to ensure a more sustainable and responsible approach to what's left behind at the end of a game. RTS, a better waste company. Find out more at RTS.com. Welcome back to the Wild Podcast. We are heading into overtime, and we welcome back our lovely co-host, Stephanie Jokian. Hannah was great. What were your thoughts on our interview with Hannah? Well, you know, I spoke with Hannah prior to our interview, and then learning more as she spoke, I, I just, I, I am just amazed at how much we still have to learn about trash and recycling and how to be better for the environment to create sustainability. When she was talking about, you know, when you don't separate your trash, the things sitting in the, in the landfill that could have been used to create a bench or to create other things that um, we could use and consume. So I think that it's just education, 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 and using the kids to educate the families was brilliant because Honestly, I had not, and I'm embarrassed to say, I wasn't like Janine, but I didn't start recycling <laughs> until Max went to a recycle center and got on me about it. It was like, mommy, we need to be recycling. And, and every time before I throw something in, I go, Max, can we recycle this? I mean, I have to ask my son. <laughs> like it's, I think, you know, getting our, our younger generations involved and motivated and educating their families is great. If you don't have people that just didn't know any better like me. And I'm glad that they're doing that and not just the bare minimum of collecting trash and, and doing their own thing, but making it about education. You know, I, I noticed too that unfortunately in the communities, yes, there was more trash during COVID, more than I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. And um, to hear that it was 75% greater and yet the call to action is improving sustainability, right? By 75%. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all these, I, I was just, I, I thought she was wonderful. I think that we need to have uh, more education on this and I can't stress it enough. And that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I love that you brought up um, your children educating you because I want to switch gears in this segment and I want to talk about what you or what you have learned from your parents. So this week, uh, obviously we have a very special day coming up. Father's Day is Sunday. Uh, I saw on WOW Social, we asked members to share posts on how my dad inspired and motivated me. Stephanie had one, Stephanie, you had one you wanted to share from a WOW member. Can you share those posts? I thought it was great. So Susie shared with us, um, she said, dad has always inspired and motivated me. He taught me love, compassion, patience, kindness, and respect. If I get overwhelmed, he says, Suze, you know how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. He is supportive and encouraging. My daughters and I are lucky to have him as a role model. I just thought that that quote was so unique, but accurate, right? Not to get overwhelmed. Yeah. So just thought that was fun and wanted to share that from a WOW member. Yeah, yeah I we, think too. Yeah. Go ahead, Jay. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, we talk about um, on the WOW and in overtime, we, we focus on empowerment and girl power, but I'll tell you my power and my hustle mentality comes from my father. You know, he's the hardest worker I've ever met. And I totally agree with Susie. You know, when I get overwhelmed and all worked up, I just think about how much he has taken on uh, for my family and how much he has done for me and the way that he handles it with just that grit and grace. So um, I definitely can relate to that. Yeah, I mean, my experience is exactly the same. My father, you know, my parents, we talked about it a little bit at the last segment, just, you know, the hardships that they had being a biracial couple and ultimately those hardships 
ended in a divorce for them just because they couldn't Mm -hmm. work it out, unfortunately. So my father was literally, you know, everything because he had a household. My mom ran her household. So he cooked, he cleaned. um, He made sure that we knew how to do all of those things as well. And he really raised us with a sports mentality. And so we were talking earlier about um, Doug Williams. Like I was a total tomboy and loved Doug Williams, loved football, basketball, boxing. Like we watched it all and we participated in gymnastics and dance and track and field was our sport. And he, I, I think we just learned so many lessons from our father through sports and how to be tough and how to not give up. And he always would tell us, you know, pump your arms. Like, at, you know, that last 100 yards, like pump your arms, pump your arms. <laughs> and it's so funny because we use that now, like when someone falls down, like if our niece or nephew falls down or skins their, um, you know, elbow or they're having a tough day, we're just like, just pump your arms, just pump your arms. Like they're not even in a track and field race, but it's like this whole idea of keep going, keep pushing, be strong, um, you know, be the strong person that you are. And it has nothing to do with being a female or a male. Our father really raised us to just be strong individuals. So happy Father's Day. <laughs> right? That's amazing. Um, so I guess for me, my father, he always tells me, you know, we need to build up these boys, you know, my sons to send them off to the world because the world's going to beat you down on its own. And so our job as parents is to build them up, to build confidence. And, you know, he took an interest in me. I didn't do sports like Eugenie and I did dance and um, tortured him with that, but he, he took a special interest and his mother told him, you have a daughter and you need to get involved in her interests. And so I remember he's the one that taught me my skincare regimen. He went and he learned. He took me to the school. He said, this is what you need to do. I love and that. It was crazy. Like he just took that interest, like his mother told him, to, you know, get involved, build me up in different ways. He would play with me and then he'd say, okay, I've done dolls and now you have to come out and do basketball and wiffle ball or something before I go crazy. So, you know, he always, you know, <laughs> uh, he taught me about compromise, right? I'm going to do this with you and you're going to do this with me now. And he always challenged me to improve, um, you know, like I said, to, uh, but yet he built me up. You know, he was my biggest fan along with my mother. Um, but he also made sure I knew how to laugh at myself. And I think that that's a great quality. You know, his nickname for me was Nose. And that was so, I had humility all the time, right? You know, he'd be like, what's up, Nose? I'm like, thanks, Dad, that's awesome. Yeah. But, uh, and he- You're like, y'all gave me this Nose. <laughs> But, uh, and just the last thing I would say about him is he, he kicks my butt when I'm down. It's tough love. You know, he won't let me stay down for long. He's like, get yourself together. Nobody wants to see you like this. You know, like it's tough, but it's great. And I thank him for all that he's done in making me the strong woman that I am. Absolutely. And I think that is such a valuable lesson. You know, you you might not have a completely similar interest. You know, you might not be playing the sports that align with him, but it's to find something that you can relate and like the skincare thing for me, it was, I wasn't a big athlete, but pageantry and dance was my sport. And dad was just, you know, you you nailed that turn um, during your talent competition. Like he would just be the biggest cheerleader. And I think that, you know, that is such a a huge thing for parents to do. And uh, I want to say happy father's day to all the wow fathers out there. Um, It is such a special holiday. And I um, hopefully if you can't spend it with them physically six feet apart, I hope that you are having a nice Father's Day Zoom (laughs) happy hour, maybe. Uh, So that is a wrap on um, the WOW podcast this week. I want to give a big plug that next week we have a very special guest. We have Jordan Hill, who is VP of Operations of Midliminal. We are excited to hear her story. Uh, Also, as always, follow The Wow on Instagram. Also, download, review, rate, subscribe to The Wow Podcast. You can find it on iTunes and redskins.com. Thank you so much uh, for listening to The Wow, and have a great week. Thank you, guys. Bye. Happy Father's Day. Bye. Even though COVID-19 poses an unprecedented challenge, you can count on Novak to deliver reliable power and to help in other ways. Novec.com offers tips to save energy while spending more time at home. Novec customers can monitor their energy use online, as well as pay bills through the website or by phone. And anyone can donate to help neighbors in need through Operation Roundup. Novec, power you can count on. The Department of Veterans Affairs has the honor 
of providing care to those who have served this country in uniform. Today, the VA is on the front lines of the battle against the coronavirus, and we need your help. We are looking for medical professionals at every level. I hope that you will consider joining our team, either temporarily or permanently. To learn more, go to va.gov slash join us.